This episode brought to you by Max Belts. Guys, are you looking for a perfect accessory to wear every single day for every single scenario? Well, you've come to the right place. We all know that nothing stands up to wear and tear like a good leather belt. If you're looking for the toughest leather belt on earth, then you've come to the right place. Max Belts. They're handcrafted in the USA by veterans who are serious about their craft. And if you're looking for a belt that's tough enough for your active lifestyle and help support those who've given so much to our country, look no further than Max Belts. It's the toughest belt on the planet. It's a perfect solution for casual or dress wear and ideal for utility and firearm carry. It's the highest caliber of American craftsmanship, and it also positively impacts our military charity partners. Once again, Max Belts, you can't go wrong with them. I wear them every day. They're the toughest belt on earth. And you can find all of this and so much more at maxbelts.com. Hey guys, welcome back to the DTD podcast, Dynamic Tales Delivered. And I got to tell you, this is super exciting. Um, I've been invited down by the staff at the Special Warfare Center to take part in something that I don't think a lot of people get to take part in, and especially the general public. So I want to first start off by saying I'm super honored. It's the dawning of the Green Beret with all the new Green Berets that came out. Today, uh, I have with me Command Sergeant Major Waldo. He was the guest speaker today, and I want to talk to you about the past, the present, and kind of the future of Special Forces, how you see the future changing, and just to talk about a couple of things. I want to start first by saying a couple of the quotes that you said in there. You said, take about a day but be ready tomorrow. Yeah. Can we talk about that? Because how important that is? It, it, it 100% is. And, and when you say take a bow, it's take a long, be proud of what you just accomplished. But it's, it's also the easiest days are behind us for everybody. But you find you build grit and you build resilience and you get better and better. So I want them to enjoy this. It was beautiful seeing the amount of families here. You're reminded that it is a family business and, and, and that's your why. But be ready tomorrow. The world is super complex. It's... I'm reminded when I was a youngster and growing up in northern Michigan, you know, you, you pack the, the snow the snow mounds high and you play king of the mountain. And when you're in the bottom going up, you have one focus. That's just to get to the, the top of the mountain. But then once you get up there, you realize, well, this isn't very much fun. Now i got to worry about everything around me. I'm going to go back down and try to work my way back up again. We as a nation, and if our adversaries are listening, we are, we are king of the mountain right now, and I'm not shy about saying that. But when we're doing that, we don't know when the next threat's going to we got to be ready for everything. And so take a bow today, but absolutely be ready tomorrow. And, and I want to talk specifically about why it's so important, so important that special operations and, and most importantly, the Green Beret is at the forefront of that because there's so many different multitudes of, first off, Green Berets, jobs that they do, and yeah things that they're taking a part of around the world that I don't think a lot of people know of. I think they think Green Beret, they think of the John Wayne movie. Sure. They they think war and that's it. They, think they, they don't talk about the, yeah. the team building and the nation building and the army building that you guys put efforts into and village rehabilitation all over the world. So yeah. can we talk a little bit about that and the kind of the future of how you're looking at that? It's, it is back to the future and a lot of things is going back to the core necessity. You know, you put in one ODA, and that's that's the equivalent of putting battalions or divisions onto a ground. So we're, we're we're force providers, but we're going in often without a. So we we have to be self-sufficient. We're often often going into places if they they need green berets or they need green berets. They're oppressed, and that's what we're going in there. That's why we have so many different military occupational skills, and so we can go in and be self-sufficient to do these things. Going into the future, you know, when you're looking at robotics and AI and we'll incorporate all those things, it's super important and we got to be able to communicate in this very high tech world. But ultimately, it comes down to the core of the human beings, which is what they go through this crucible of a, of a selection process to come back here because of all the external things that need to change, the core has to remain the same. And that's what you're seeing in here. And I talked a little bit too about, you know, we have very brilliant and compassionate folks, but they love each other and it's a warrior love. And you're seeing that and, and when you're all you're gotten, when you're all you have in this very desolate area and you're going in and then you have to, number one, find people that are willing to resist the oppression all for the greater good. And then you got to somehow galvanize those and train them into a, a, a fighting force that can resist 
you know, resist the enemy and, and take the fight to the enemy. But if you can't do that yourself, if you're not the example of what a galvanized, cohesive organization unit is, then you don't have a chance. Well, and it's important, I think, and, and very instrumental that you bring up that it dwindles all back down essentially to the soldier, to the core yeah. being. The technology is there, the weapons are there, the ammunition is there, but mm. when everything breaks down, it all comes back to them. Mm -hmm. An interesting part of the way I see the world kind of opening up now is you have soldiers today that don their Green Beret that right. weren't even alive when 9-11 Isn't happened. that crazy? Thanks for bringing that up, by the way. <laughs> well, and yeah. I think it's an important thing to bring up because – there were guys that weren't even alive during 9-11 that are yeah. now going to take the fight into the future. Mm -hmm. And when you say it goes down to the core, I want you to tell me what that core is because we have soldiers that spent their entire careers at war. That's yeah. unheard of in history. They spent their entire military lives at war, and now they're training and, and bringing in this new group of people that know nothing of war, know nothing of the atrocities that happened on 9-11. Yeah. So yeah. how do we meld those two together and make that same person that you were talking about down to the core? That's story? a number one, and obviously an astute question to ask. And then for a lot of us that joined, like I joined the military in 97. And, and for us, 9-11 was kind of the Vietnam guys. The older folks had all been in Vietnam. But I remember feeling some kind of way about, man, I don't have the, the combat patch. And, I don't, and you're seeing a generation of folks that don't have that. But, but what do we know? So what did we do about it? Well, you have that shared hardship. You know, when you come into our thing, you're about number one, and that's a, another beautiful thing. And I, I'm a very proud G Water. You know, those are the only awards I wear on my uniform, on my campaign ribbons, because I'm proud of that. But it's also a generation that, that had that focus. Okay, here's our, we gotta get to the top of the mountain here. That's our focus, and that's why I'm gonna join. But now you're just joining for something that's beautiful. It's selfless. Because you're just, you know, like, well, I want to be part of something better than me. I want to be to be able to provide answers when we don't really know what the question is. So that's what it, so that's what the folks were getting in now that have that that sense of uh, of a higher purpose for something bigger than themselves and maybe each other. So then what you do is you harness that, and now you're going through a very, you put them through a crucible. It's not easy. It's not comfortable. Yeah, you were, we're, we're saying, hey, we're gonna. You got to give us the best you got, and you're gonna fail anyway, and you're gonna fail a couple times, and you got to figure out how to persevere when you have that kind of core then there's nothing that can stop you and then that's part one part two of that is we get folks that you know it's all about the journey it's not about the the pat on the back it's a little counterintuitive you know we have a big thing and it's beautiful the families come in but we're the quiet professionals most of our things will never be known outside the few of us that are that'll know about it and then but we're, we're too busy to, to, to keep the praise and the awards because we're on to the next thing already and so you've got the character of that. You've got the selfless service. That's the core of, of, of what we're talking about here. And the good news is there's enough of us old folks that were here be, before the, the GWAT that can kind of fall back. And, okay, this is uncomfortable, but it's, it's also not too unfamiliar. Well, and, and you bring up an interesting point again about that, that differentiated, that, that these people are doing selfless service. And so when they come in, they're not expecting a war, I don't think, anymore. No. Nope. Uh, but they definitely are on the, the, the lookout for it. And, yep. and that's an interesting way to put it is be on the lookout for it. Mm -hmm. Because I think that in today's environment, we're moving into so many different areas, into cyber warfare. Yeah. We're moving into stuff that we're not going to have boots on the ground, drones and all of those kind yep. of things. But we still need to have that person in place to move into those countries to make sure that stability is there. Because you can look at everything in the world through a 30,000-foot view. Mm -hmm. But when you get down to the ground level is when you start seeing stuff that you might not see from yes. that level. Yes, yes. And that's the – it's such a – it's intimidating, especially for those of us that aren't – you know, we're, we're getting into this data-infused world and, and all these things. And that's the whole goal from now on is that there's no human blood on first contact and so is the robotics and it's in this and this. But as you said, it all comes down to human being interaction and you're in, in, in persuading and influencing and, and frankly helping. You know, Dale Presserly Bear is a real thing, freeing the oppressed. You can't do that through artificial intelligence. That can inform and that can help, but you also got to strip that away. And if it goes really, really bad, most of that stuff will go away anyway. And then, by God, we better remember how to use an, a compass and a map kind of things. Well, on yeah. the speaking of artificial intelligence that you bring up there, 
I think we could bring up another point that there's a lot of misinformation out there. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. whether that be in, in my career field in law enforcement, whether it be in the military first responders, yeah. with that misinformation out there, you get a couple of different problems that happen from it. One, we start chasing our tails about things that maybe we don't need to yeah. chase our tails about. Number two, the public is not as informed as well as back in the day when you mentioned the Vietnam War, where you just report the news. You don't put your opinion in on it. You just say what happened. And so can you speak to a little bit about misinformation and how we're going to try and fix that from our end uh, going forward to let the American public know, like, Look, you may have heard that, but this is what's really going on. The, the good news for special operations, we have the best psychological operation operators in the business that can do that offensively. But when you do something very well offensively and defensively, it helps you to, to prepare for it. But what I'm finding is there's so much information out there, and you got all, and it, the pendulum swings back and forth. But what you're finding is people are getting more attuned, and, and, and the radars are up to me like, okay, is this really what is – but obviously in the military, apolitical, so that helps right there when you get all these things in, you cut away, and we, we, we swear a fealty to the Constitution. And so you keep that azimuth, and that, that really helps you to, to bump steer. As far as one thing that seems to work remarkably well is just in the way we, you know, because we have a lot of information to, to provide, too, and situation reports and these things, that, you know, you, when you cut away and you, you get good at executive communication, you've got small little a small time to put a lot of information up to decision makers. You've got to be concise and you've got to be precise and you've got to be very consistent and brief. And when you do that, that automatically strips away a lot of the opinion and the emotion. So inherently, as you're training to be isolated and alone in a frame, when you've got one little window to get a lot of information out. So that's how the information you're getting from our folks, the decision makers, is filtered out. And so you're almost inherently at a young age or you're building in those those blocks from the misinformation and, and be able to defend away from the from the enemy adversarial psychological operations. I don't know if that's a that answer, but you no, were, that, you're no going that that there. does. Uh, but it brings up another point. We talked earlier about the quiet professional yeah. for so many years. It was really the quiet professional. No one knew anything yeah. about what was going on. I myself think it's very important that you guys get your stories out there. Maybe not operational security stuff, maybe not where you were, maybe not the, the, the minutia of the mission, but it definitely the bravery, the honor, the things that people have done around this world to make this country the greatest country in the world need to be told. And so how do we bridge that gap of, yeah, we need to be quiet professionals, yeah. but hey, we also need to tell our story. It needs to be known. I, you know, my heart is so full because we're, we're sitting down here doing this because you're doing it. Unfortunately, the bad news, sir, is is the 167 folks. They're not going to want to tell their stories. They're going to be on to the next objective. So it's on to the folks that the game's passed by a little bit to to understand that. You know, they don't seek credit. It's our job to provide that credit, but. The amount of love and, and, and admiration that's coming from folks like you to, to help us with that, it fills the heart. So we can't, it's not going to come from us, I don't think. I think it's going to come from being receptive, being, being humble, but let, let them do their business. Let them operate as hard as, as good as they can, and, and let's honor our folks when, they, when they're done with their service and they're not in harm's way anymore. And let's also allow you in, in, in these kinds of, of opportunities to let's get the story out here. Because we're awfully damn proud of our folks. We couldn't be more proud. A hundred percent. And, yeah. and, and I, I couldn't agree with that more. And I feel, you know, you and I have talked on the side that, that these stories aren't out there. The people yeah. don't know about what's going on, and they only see what's going on. I think yeah. with people knowing information, it may take away that fear a little bit. Yeah. People in my, in my job field, they're scared to tell their families about stuff. I know that you guys are scared to tell their families about stuff because, you, one, you don't want to be a Debbie Downer and come home and yeah. tell them everything that you're seeing, but you also don't want to place them in fear. But I think I've learned over the last couple of decades that that takes away that fear of knowing a little yeah. bit about what's going on That's and understanding point. what's going on. Maybe not, yeah. once again, where we're talking about the operational security or the mission itself, the minutia of it, but definitely... Just, hey, yeah. this is what we do, and this is why we do it. And I think this kind of stuff where you invite the families in and you let them see it, but it almost makes me think these guys, you know, you said let them go out and do their thing. 
that's where kind of the rubber hits the road. Yeah. And it's going to be a whole different world to them. Everyone has an idea of what it's going to be like when they're done. Can you talk a little bit about what they're feeling right now? Because you know that feeling. <laughs> their, their hearts are so full and their bellies have so many butterflies swimming around. A lot of them, they're not quite ready to go operational. They're going to go and they're going to learn the language and all these things. But, it, you know, a lot of these folks, they, they show up on a, on a Thursday right out of Fort Moore, right out of, the, and their, their, their eyebrows are way up here. And they're looking around, and, and they know it's going to be hard, but they keep just moving forward. And then, like I talked about in this video, you know, the rucksack gets heavy, and all, but they're still there. They're still, so they've gone through all this. Now you're seeing on here, and I got to look every single one of them in the eye and talk about just reinvigorating, but the, the brows are furled, and they're ready. You know, so they're going to take the bow today like we talked about. But what they're feeling right now, and they got the, the flash of the group they're going to go and represent, they're getting into the books. They're learning about, okay, if I, I'm going to get smart in the Indo-Pacific area, and I'm going to be pay attention to, to politics. But they're also honing in their craft because they also want, you know, there's that pride thing. You want to show up, and you want to be – you know, you want to be affected right off the bat. You want to, you want to do it. So they get, they got this sense right now of okay, I'm very proud of this, but, but damn it, put me in. Like let's let's get let's get down to it. So, I, uh, I think all of us in, in this stage always want to trade places to to go back and, and to be what they're doing right now. You talk about that going back. Is there anything you'd change? This episode is brought to you by Trident Coffee, the veteran-owned brand where every sip inspires you to live life full steam ahead. At Trident, they are more than just coffee. They are storytellers. It's crafted by veterans. Their instant cold brew is perfect for those who serve, those who have served, and anyone who values wellness. Featuring natural ingredients like organic mushrooms, adaptogens, and nootropics, it's more than just a morning pick-me-up. It's your new wellness ritual. Enjoy it at home or on the go, wherever your day takes you. Trident Coffee isn't just about great tasting coffee. It's about empowering you to be the healthiest version of yourself because great veterans make great citizens. Try their instant cold brew coffee today and taste the freedom of wellness. Remember, when you choose Trident, you're not just choosing coffee. You're choosing a path of connection through health and wellness. Use promo code DTD15 for 15% off your order. And I get that a lot, especially after the, you know, with Afghanistan and all those things. And I get that. Like, what would you change? And uh, you think about moments that I've, unfortunately, I've failed a heck of a lot more than I've, I've succeeded. And you always go back if I could do this differently. But, you know, I had a friend by the name of Garth Brooks, not literally my friend, but he had told me once, you know, I could I could miss the pain and I could miss all these things. But, but then I would have had to, to have missed the dance. I would have gone right back and just danced as hard as I could all over again and, and sitting right here. So to, to answer your question, there's probably little things I could go back and I'm like, ah, you know, but I wouldn't have changed the thing. So let me ask you then, too. It changes your worldview. It has to. 20 years in law enforcement, I have 18 right now. Yeah. It changes your worldview. Yeah. You can't do anything but do that. Mm -hmm. 20 years of your worldview of a world at war, pretty yeah. much. Can we talk about how you change from that young guy that <laughs> just donned his green yeah. beret until the guy sitting in front of me here, how your worldview changes, whether it's good or bad, it still changes you as a person. Yeah, I, uh, it's that old, you know, the same people get the credit for the quotes, but it's the older I get, the less sure of things I am. And, and, and that's what I found. I'm, I'm a lot more curious you know not everything is black and white that bad guys and good guys and it's never quite that but i i found that the older i get the more in the perspective you want to learn you know number one for our folks you're going to go in we're going to tell you hey you gotta you gotta organize all these all these folks into a force well you gotta understand you gotta truly not just understand to learn them but care about them care deeply understand but understand the adversary and in, in in the holistic why of those things and and that's what the biggest thing I've noticed is that I ask a lot of questions. I hit a little bit on here. These these youngsters here and me too, you know, you're proud of where you come from. You, you're you not going to walk by a piece of trash without picking it up. You're, you're not going to walk by something like a like a window sill or something that looks a little bit off without trying to fix it. It's just, just you want to make everything around you better. And, 
and so that's probably the biggest thing for me that's changed is just wanting to, to, to understand more and, and to challenge assumptions. Well, even to more on that quote of let's use your quote, for example, you said every room they walk in now, they will command. Subtly command. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, you know, humility, you know, but you just, there's a confidence because you go through something like this and whether, or they're seal brother and Marine, when they go through a, that shared hardship, and you, and you come out on top of that. You just have an internal confidence, but you don't have to boast about it. You know what I mean? You just you come in, and there's this aura, and, and I wish I could articulate the words, but but you can feel it. And when these guys, especially when they go into these rooms, people just, you know, they say that fight attendants, when they're in the airplane, they're, everyone's coming in, they're kind of looking to see, okay, who's going to be the one? If something goes bad, they kind of get a sense of who, who's going to help us with something. Those are our, you know, those are our folks. You know, those are the folks that you just, they just have this aura about them. But I owe you a better answer than that. But you can, it's just a feeling you get, no, but it's, it's built from confidence. I, I yeah. think that, you know, I think the best answers I've always found, the best answers are the ones that you feel the truest about. So Yeah, that's a great way of answer. saying that. Yeah, uh, it's not it's, very articulate. It, it, it doesn't but, matter, though. It, yeah. it, it's how you feel about it. The other things that we want to talk about about your speech was you talk about no riches or rewards. Yeah. No one's going to become a millionaire being in the military. Yeah, No I know. one's going to become, you know, rich and famous from mm -hmm. it. Let's talk about why you did it. No riches or rewards, so you know better than anyone. Uh, yeah, well, it became apparent early on that I wasn't going to be in the NBA or the NFL <laughs> and uh, small town how, politics, how, keeping how my how reps. How soon on did you figure that well, out? Well, that was about eighth grade. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was lucky. I had my, my grandfather was uh, in World War II, and I had Uncle Wemo, which he was called Uncle Wemo because he showed up at West Point, and he was five foot nine. and when he graduated West Point, he was 6'10", so he grew a wee bit mo. Uh, he, he, was a, he was a colonel in the Army, West Point, and, and I knew earlier, and I got to grow up on TV shows like Tour of Duty and and. and and uh you know the rambos and it's early early on you're that was growing up in northern michigan but the sense of i i guess loyalty and 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 selfless service that's in compassion that's from my mom and dad i i got i was very lucky in how i was raised and they instilled those things and i don't we didn't have a lot of money growing up but i didn't know you know i would assume i had everything i ever wanted looking back and i was just happy and so i was very fortunate the the money thing and, and all those so I guess when you put those things together, and it was it was 1990, it was the mid 90s. You know, life was it wasn't super popular to to join the military then, but that was kind of appealing to it too. I wanted to to test myself a little bit. You know, I it's funny I always didn't know why I went when I was a youngster in, in Gaylord, Michigan, which not a lot of military active military presence up there. I went into the recruiting thing, and I looked the recruiter right in the eye, and I said, I want to be a I want to be an Army SEAL, and he uh, kind of looked at me. And, <laughs> He said, okay, well, and he went back then he rolled out the little TV thing with the VCR and the TV and he put the tape in and then you see a a guy on a dirt bike and a guy in a ghillie suit and I'm like, oh, I, yeah, that's me. I want to, he goes, yeah, you're in front of the tanks. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's me. And it was a cavalry scout and that's not, that's kind of what a cavalry scout did, but not really, but, but uh, they had me at hello. So I guess for me, why did I do it? Uh, that's just sort of how I was I was raised. And part of it's a little, you know, skinny kid with the last name Waldo, which I'm proud of. You know, you want to prove you got some metal in there too, a little bit, and uh, and prove something to yourself. Yeah. Well, you know, I've talked to more than one guy that has said that motor the motorcycle video that you're talking <laughs> about was what got them. Ah, that's that's uh, it. Yeah, uh, a guys uh, that I've talked to said, yeah, they they got me hook, line, and sinker with yeah. that one. So. There is a difference, though. You were big army in the beginning. I was, uh, yeah. And, and now you are into a very small community. I want to talk to you about the two things that are alike, and they parallel each other, but they're different. There's a brotherhood in the big army. Sure. That there is. But there's definitely a brotherhood in special operations in this smaller, very select group of people. Yeah. Can you kind of compare and contrast the two differences? Man, that's great, and... You know, I came over pretty pretty young, and just as a cavalry scout, it, that was kind of the you're getting in, if and, and you want to, you like the challenge of it. The, the natural logical next thing was to go to special forces assessment selection. And you know, I was in Fort Polk, Louisiana, Fort Johnson now, first the 509th, and that was sort of a and that was a great thing. But to compare and contrast, 
you, you know, and I'm going to just keep this be repetitive, but you're going back to that shared hardship. So the first thing you do when you go to a selection is you, you take the names off, you take the ranks off, and all you got is engineer tape and a number. And, and when you strip it down to the core like that, it doesn't, you know, names don't matter. The only thing that matters is, is what's inside of all that and how willing you are to do that. And when you go through something like that and, and, and it's all finished and, and, you know, you start with a lot and you look left and right. So having that, you know, basic training is, is that a little bit, you know, there's that kind of right there. But it's just another level when you when you keep and it's not being divisive. It's just that's the, the biggest, you know, you've got people that have all had that shared hardship, that shared crucible. And, and and frankly, you know, there's also a willingness to, again, you're not going to get great rewards or riches. It's pretty cool putting the tab on your shoulder, you know what I mean, and those kinds of things. But that's about the extent of, of, of the decorations you get. The rest of it, you, you find you have, like, folks that are that are very similar. Well, let's bring up a point that, that is at the front of a lot of people's minds now, and that's recruitment. Not only yeah. recruitment for the big army, but recruitment for special operations. It's all connected, yeah. And we're we're seeing in law enforcement, we're seeing it in the military. People just aren't taking that step a lot anymore. Yeah, it's something that has to be done because if we lose that law enforcement, military, first responders, if we lose that section of the population, we're in for trouble. So, yeah. how do we build those relationships up to let the young people of today you know no this is a good way of life because i think a lot of them with the instant gratification and stuff look at it and yeah. go mm, 20 years i'm not seeing it i'm not seeing it and that was not you know and i hate to keep back in the day but you know when i joined it was you, you come in you get the you're coming in to get three years and then you can go to college for free sort of thing but i i think Saying things out loud, number one, is the biggest thing. So we have a deficit of trust with the civilian population in us, and, and we can blame it. But you say it out loud like, yeah, we got to rebuild trust a little bit, and, and we're all doing that. We all understand that, hey, we, we're we lacking here. People don't – it used to be that the Army was a very trusted thing, and, and, and perhaps we're not trusted that. You know what I mean? They see the, the remnants of 20 years of combat, and on one hand, you're like, yeah, we're really taking care of people. But then you're like, but, you know, I don't want my beloved to, to, to have to suffer through, you know, brain injuries and all these things. And But you say things out loud, and you're like, okay, that's that's part of that, the sacrifice that's a, a, a great honor. But it's also saying, but the other way of looking at that is look at the amount of care and love that you're coming into something that cares about you. That will, that will but we are all saying it out loud now. And what you're seeing now is that we are getting out into the community and we're getting anytime our folks go anywhere to train, there's always a stop through a high school. There's always a stop through very successfully because we're, we're encouraging that. Hey, get out and tell your story. Why did you get here? Why did you do that? We're getting so good at it. What we got to get better at now is coordinating these things a little bit because we're having random acts of, of these things. We're not, we're not coordinating it. So that's a big one. The other thing is once you find these people, is is making sure they're prepared to, to get in and, and that's what we're doing so i think the long way of getting to yeah you know it's it's not popular to join the military to, to get into law enforcement now but i think you're going to see the pendulum start swinging back i think you're slowly starting to 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 see it it's september 10th 2001 <laughs> it was uh oh. Anyway, yeah, Two September days. 10th, yeah, and then all of a sudden, then September 12th, everyone had an American flag on their porch, and and I pray we don't need something like that to galvanize this again. But we might we might get sucker punched, but no one gets off the mat better than Americans. Well, and and you bring that up, and it, that's what's so funny to me when I look out over the landscape and I see that on September 12th, flags were on everyone's door. Yeah. But then two, three months, six months, a yeah, year, yeah, ten years, goes. however you want to do it, uh-huh. people forget about it. And I always wonder what makes those people forget that. It was so important in those days yeah. that followed it. It was so important to let people know we were united and we were all this and then divisiveness split us up or mediocrity or whatever you want to call it split us up again. And I always wonder what does that? What what pushes us to go from a flag on our door to... Yeah, well, especially back then, because there wasn't a lot of social media back then. And it's even worse now because you, you get in it so quick to get into And when you when you speak the vice of it, it ties a little bit back to our recruiting things, man. But you see it today. And you, you know, this thing was packed. And if you look at our formation, it's you can literally America can look into our formations and see the best of itself. And how did we move on from from all that? 
because you, you focus in on a, on a task and you focus and you have a, a common purpose and, and the common purpose is liberty. You know, that will galvanize everything. Part of it is you got to weather the, weather the storms a little bit. You know what I mean? I, I'll tell you as a diehard Michigan fan, I don't care much for the Ohio folks the third weekend in November, you know, but by, we don't want to talk about that Texas game, right? No, no. Okay. No, I, I just don't wanted want to, to make sure that, <laughs> but you know what? The guys kept it. Yeah, that hurt. That hurts. Yeah, thanks for bringing it. Yeah. Up. See, yeah, I'm divisive now. Well, I went to Oklahoma State, so, I, you know. I, you got I, a big one this weekend. Yeah, I, do, I have a huge one, so. Yeah, I think uh, you're not favored. Yeah, no, we're not. But it's college football. <laughs> but, see, and that's kind of a, you know, we can hate each other and it's fun, but when it all matters on Tuesday morning, you know, the following thing, well, sometimes you just got to trust and just kind of wade through it and, how about put the put that stuff away and focus on the positive things and maybe go out and it kind of goes back to pick up a piece of trash on the sidewalk and you know say hello to someone you you, you don't typically talk to and just be interested and learn about them and, yeah. and man oh man it goes back to the perspective thing and I think it goes one more step when we talk about recruiting into special operations yeah. now we go even deeper into big army and we take a look around and yeah. you know, okay so who are these guys you, you know you talked about it how they've triple volunteered yeah how do we go when we find these guys how do we go you know what you're good here but i think you'd be better over here that's a great point and when you talk to some of these folks that, that didn't come through the 18 18 x-rays where they go directly from from civilian life right in, directly in the pipeline when you talk a lot of them they had some kind of interaction with an operational detachment or they they saw our folks somewhere a lot of times it's like, man, I was over here and I saw those guys pretty cool over there, not having to have the same, you know, something little like that. Part of it is you see the, you see their eyeballs and you see the professionalism of our folks, and you're like, man, I could be a part of that. But one of the biggest things, you know, we got our Den Street on Fort Liberty. Never, never walk in our Den Street, but they close that thing off, and it's, it's, it's for for physical training, and and you see formations running and. Every about a couple of times a month, you know, you get the new special forces class getting ready in brown t shirts and, and black shorts and then and they take up the entire there's rows of them and they're running hard and they're running fast and majority of the folks the of the conventional folks will, will kinda of turn away a little bit and they won't make eye contact. But there's always a couple. There's always a couple that'll look right out there and you can you can see it. You can see it a little bit of the and that that might be me. Maybe not, but that could be me. And those are the folks that our, our recruiters do a really good job of, of sifting through and, and finding them and, and doing it. Because, you know, like the song says, a hundred will test and only, you know, we're not going to lower standards. You know, it's it's hard. It's not for everybody, too. And that's no great crime if it if you just if you don't make it. But if you if you try, we're going to love you and we're going to take care of you. And uh, that, that's what we do. You, you find those folks that don't that don't turn away at the, the sign of, of challenge. Well, I think a good way to kind of end this conversation is in something that you said there, and I want to talk touch on something that you spoke about again in your speech. I want to know from your mouth, your brain, why is a Green Beret such a complex soldier, person, and a human being? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great. I, I think it's. Because it's unstructured. It's a little bit of the, you know, you're, you're being asked to provide an answer when people aren't really particularly sure of the question. So it's someone that a lot of people say, oh, I want, I don't, I don't want to be structured by laws and rules and I want ambiguity. People don't want ambiguity. They like to know, okay, here's my left and right limit and here's if I did a good job or a bad job. Our folks, when you're alone and unafraid and you've got some platitude filled big objective. No one, you're not going to, you got to trust your guts and your instincts. If you, those are the, that kind of complexity, to, to be comfortable being that uncomfortable, but having the instincts to, to understand like a greater purpose, even if it's way, way out there, way layered away, that's the complexity of the human. And you got to be nuts to want to go and traverse through a swamp and live in the woods for, for, for a long time and, and all those things. And so that's the, the complexity of the human spirit. But, uh, like I said, right. It's the best of us, you know what I mean? Well, I think in closing, I'm going to give the spotlight to you and, and say this is you bringing people in. What's your message to people? Because I think that's the most important thing out of today, out of this weekend. What is the message that you're portraying, and what are you telling people that have never thought about this 
are possibly thinking about it or are really serious about it. Yeah, I guess my message, not to, 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 to boil it all the way down, it's a little bit of, you know, if America can look into our formation to see the best of itself. And you could be part of that. You know, if you got a little little steel in the spine, if your if your shoulders broaden instead of asking for lesser burden, if you're willing to put yourself out there without the expectation of credit, if you're willing to give everything you have for somebody else, and the and but have the trust and love in your heart to know that they're gonna do the same for you, only to just to ultimately make something better. Not only is that great character, but that's the message. If that's if that's you, we don't need everybody. You can't take everybody. But if that's you, if we need that that one percent of the of the human that has that, that willingness to put themselves in the crucible, to put themselves into the arena, and and and, and fight and and love, then that's that's who we're that's who we would like to have in here. Well, it, it's been amazing talking to you. It's been a complete honor of mine to talk to you, and and I, I look forward to seeing not only this chapter of your life, but what's happening next, because I know you're approaching retirement yeah. at some point and, yeah. and what you're going to do to kind of carry that spirit forward. So it was yeah. a complete honor. Thank you so much for meeting with me today and talking. Oh, this was great. Thank and, you. Uh, you know, guys, this is what it's all about. This is, you know, it's, it's hard things that happen, mm -hmm. but it makes you who you are. And I don't yeah. think that anyone should shy away from something that's going to make them a better person. Yeah. And from seeing this ceremony today, from talking yeah. to you, from being here in just this, I mean, for Fort Liberty, Fort Bragg, yeah. whatever you want right? to call it, feel it. It it, yeah. it, it is history. It is yeah. part of the United States. As big as you can talk about the Revolutionary War, when yeah. people talk about the United States Army mm -hmm. Special Operations, they talk about this place. Yeah, and you can feel the energy when you walk around here. So, yeah. it's amazing. If you guys want to know more about him, yeah. we'll be in contact and stuff. So. There may be a future longer episode where we talk about those years where you knew you weren't going to be in the NFL <laughs> and your love of Michigan and all those things. But, guys, thanks for checking this out. Make sure you catch us on the next one. Thanks. Thank you.